I guess we're, we can open up this panel kind of generally and they get a little bit more specific. Um, you know, really the lifeblood for a lot of companies is academic research or basic research as it's known. Um, that feeds the pipeline for, for drugs and therapeutics. Um, and that's where all or most of the discoveries come from. So I'm um, just kind of to set the stage here because um, a lot of people here are academics, but uh, I'll, maybe we can go from this end or someone who really wants to jump in, but maybe we'll start from this end here with Andre. Um, you know, just to kind of summarize, what are the main sources of funding for basic research, and kind of more specifically in the aging field itself? Because we, I've seen the field evolve over the past 19 years when I started working in Dr. David Sinclair's lab. Um, but how has, you know, have the main sources of funding evolved and changed over time? And, and, and what's the difference? Has it gotten easier? Has it gotten harder? I think it's gotten way easier. And I think it's going to get easier, but um, I'd like to hear some input here. I think the, the uh, uh, answers to this question would greatly vary among this group. Um, and uh, I think each of us has a different entry into the aging field. Uh, uh, for me, uh, I'm relatively new, uh, uh, new inhabitant of aging field. Uh, and uh, for me, uh, who has been uh, uh, working in oncology all my life, uh, I had to find uh, the entry through oncology um, and uh, uh, keep using the uh, sources of funding which are somehow linked to the places um, where I feel more accustomed to and where people know me. We all know that uh, regardless of the uh, existence of peer review system, money are distributed through a club type of you know, approach. If you come to a study section where nobody ever heard about you, you are being seen as a, uh, you know, with a different, with a different degree of enthusiasm, uh, unless you really pr 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 something revolutionary or something which is close to everybody's heart. Therefore, for example, for me, uh, getting money for um, aging research goes through. Uh, I have to make a little trick here and. Uh, uh, which is not a real trick because the problem is there. Uh, cancer treatment is a way to accelerate aging. And treat, treating cancer uh, creates uh, millions of people who are cancer survivors. And many things which we are studying, I name it cancer survival syndrome, which is accelerated aging. And through that, I can use kind of NCI mechanisms to run, it, to run funding through the, uh, through the, uh, through the oncology. Uh, through the oncology sources. Uh, I found it difficult for me, for example, to uh, get access to money in the National Institute of Aging, uh, exactly for the same reason. I'm a foreigner there, and I uh, may not be using the same uh, terminology or language which most of the people who are used to run, get, get their grants there do it. I wrote several grants, uh, and um, they, they was completely unsuccessful there although uh, we are, I think, publishing quite, quite well. Uh, so, um, but this is normal. Uh, the same activation barrier I had to pass when I became radiation biologist and the radiation area was resistant to, to me in the beginning, but then they become accustomed. The bottom line is uh, I think that for those who are coming to aging fields from their areas, it's much easier to start to keep get funding for their uh, research where they known and uh, just simply adjusting it to aging, uh, uh, aging field, uh, rather than jump into the waters of aging where money is distributed to those who are very well established, known there, or their students or their followers or something like that. Well, yeah, I think Andre was right in terms of here. We all have different experiences here. Uh, I can talk for myself that, you know, all of my funding actually comes from National Institute of Aging, uh, and they treated me very well over the years. Um, so, and I think the last few years, for various political reasons, funding actually improved. So I think we are really now at a very good point where uh, fund governmental funding actually became uh, more plentiful. There were some very scarce times a few years ago when you had to be like the top four percentile to get funded. Now that's no longer the case. Uh, so that's, you know, again, just my personal situation. Um, however, you know, maybe on a broader scale, 
Uh, I think aging, well, still mostly is funded uh, through NIA, which relative to other institutions go, you know, within NIH uh, gets very small fraction of funding. Uh, also, what we don't have in aging, we don't have, uh, you know, very strong lobbying or like these foundations that are dedicated, for example, to, uh, you know, solving a particular disease, which for, you know, there is a lot of those foundations for disease specific that are very strong and that fund a lot of money. There are many such foundations for cancer, various types of cancer. So we don't have that, and, and that's, I think, is a big problem, and that's where I really appreciate the work that Oliver does and, you know, meetings like that, because part of the reason, uh, you know, there is still um, this kind of, some sort of animosity towards aging. You know, not everyone, especially in Congress, understands that, you know, it's something worth addressing. And it's easier for people to think in terms of individual diseases. Well, you know, even in terms of, um, you know, money-wise for economy, it may be better to treat aging and address all diseases simultaneously. But, you know, I may be preaching to the choir here. But, you know, that's the situation. We really, we are currently missing this type of funding. And I hope this will change. Uh, you know, there is, uh, I think, increasing interest uh, you know, in the private sector to funding aging. But um, again, because biological research is much slower than technology, so the returns may not be so fast. But I think right now we are at the point where there are some interventions that may actually work and may, could make a difference. So I hope it will change. But I would say at the current point, we are really wholly dependent on the NIA. <laughs> I, uh, I actually like the NIH peer review system. I, I remember my first grant, uh, I was a fresh assistant professor in 2000, and uh, my grant went to this genome uh, analysis study section where I competed with people who sequenced the human genome, the mouse genome. I didn't know a single person on the panel. And, and the, the idea was to identify a new set of, of, of genes, uh, for, uh, protein genes, and somehow they gave me 4%. I was very impressed. Since then, I say, okay, they, they can fund somebody's new, somebody's like foreign, and uh, if somebody has a good idea. But I think uh, in the aging field, I also have some regrets. Uh, uh, is the, I, it's, I think it's very uh, difficult to fund a really innovative studies in the aging field. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's a panel composition, or, but that, that's my experience. So people have to adjust, and they might have an innovative idea, but actually propose something more mundane because it's just, you know, uh, maybe uh, easier uh, to fund. And, uh, and the second is, uh, it's just, uh, just too little money for basic research. I think there's a lot of money goes to more applied research and I, you know, in my mind, maybe it's because I'm a basic researcher, but I think it's just a waste of money, more or less. Uh, in the aging field, we still don't understand very basic processes, and I think this will be really a, the most important contribution to biomedical science. And we have, I mean, all, all relative, but very little money for that. So I have the money. <laughs> um, You're going to get swamped after we yeah, leave this room. Uh, I bought business cards. Um, at, at, in my division at the National Institute on Aging, I track uh, people who are new to biology of aging research for the last eight years. Uh, we typically fund um, 150 to 200 new awards each year in my division. Uh, this year, 66 of the investigators have never been funded before by NIA. So, um, and it's typically held at around 40 to 60 each year. Uh, in my division for the last eight years. Uh, we achieved that partly by attending meetings and asking people, in, not in the aging fields, and asking people whose research looks like it could be applied to aging uh, to consider making an application. A lot of people have, uh, as Andre indicated, a natural institute. Uh, there's an affiliation with an institute that's natural on the basis of the research, for example, if you're doing research in cancer, you're more likely to see some funding from National Cancer Institute 
one of the largest institutes in terms of dollars, but they have a very um, restricted pay line for a number of reasons. We fund on uh, annual cycles of appropriation from Congress, and our awards typically range from two to five years. The bread and butter award being the R01 award, which ru typically runs for four or five years, depending on the institute. So what we have are cycles uh, where there's time when new money becomes available, and that's typically on a five-year cycle, which was disrupted, by the way, on a, when Harold Varmus instituted a doubling of the NIH budget without planning for what would happen when you've used all that money over five years and you have no new money coming in for competing awards. Uh, at my institute, we are trying to buffer uh, that so that we don't fall off a cliff and have a sub-tenth percentile funding list, or that we don't get irrationally exuberant and fund past the 20th percentile. So we try to keep things as even as possible, and we have a concerted effort uh, to attract new investigators. In addition, the NIH has paid attention to two things. It's very hard to get your first award as a young investigator, and it is actually more difficult to get that first award renewed. So we have a program to help the first in, uh, in line investigators, and then we have a program to help those who are uh, trying to get the renewal. And then we have now just instituted NIH-wide a program to help investigators called At Risk. This is people who have had a history of funding, at least one or two grants, and then uh, they're in jeopardy of losing all of their funding uh, through the vagaries of the combination of the peer review process and where you are in the uh, this cycle of abundance and, and starvation. Um, so when you're starved, you do not, for funds, you do not have a longer lifespan in research. Uh, the funding restriction is not like calorie restriction, it just kills you. <laughs> so I, I have, a, I guess, another uh, question for you, Ronald, which is, um, do you see the situation improving in general for funding going towards the NIA so more funds can be dispersed towards researchers? I know we, I mean, every country around the world practically is having a, an aging demographic, right? The demographics are changing. It's, right. it's, it's mind-blowing when you read the re reports in the BBC where 50% of all nations on planet Earth basically are their population is not growing. It's right, it's, it's, you know, people have talked about the population explosion in the 60s, but we're seeing this, this starting to peter off, um, and aging is playing a very great role. And, um, you know, at some point, maybe now, uh, you know, um, governments and uh, other political groups are, are gonna have to start to notice that there's this tremendous shift that's happening, which has already hit some countries earlier than others, such as Japan being, you know, one, one bellwether. Um, so clearly, you're, you know, you see this landscape changing. Do you see this being reflected in um, how uh, the political landscape is affecting funding for the NIA? Is this, is this something that, is there any specifics that you can point to, or is it just more generalities? Uh, so uh, yes, there is an interest on the part of the appropriating body, Congress, uh, to fund more research at the NIH, broadly speaking, and at the NIA in particular. As was pointed out, um, there is an attractiveness of dealing with a specific disease. Uh, it's identifiable. Uh, many of them are frightening. Alzheimer's is especially a frightening disease. If you've met someone who has it that you've known for a long time, you find that that person's no longer there. And it's quite disconcerting all the way around. Um, NIA got an additional two plus billion dollars for Alzheimer's research specifically. It's a separate budget. It's called a bypass budget. It doesn't mix with the rest of the NIA budget. So we went from six years ago, 1.1 billion to now 3.3 billion or so. And, uh, but most of that increase has been in Alzheimer's disease. What happens in research is people flow toward the money. So back when metalloenzymes decades ago were popular, money flowed toward metalloenzymes and suddenly everybody found they were working on metalloenzymes. Now people find that they're working in Alzheimer's disease, which they weren't two weeks ago. So what has happened in the division of neuroscience is their basic neuroscience researchers have moved towards Alzheimer's disease research. That creates a gap in the basic research that's being done there, and we are actively trying to make an adjustment. Broadly across the NIH, 
um, the biology of aging and aging interactions with other diseases and with therapies for those diseases, case in point being accelerated aging from cancer therapies. Uh, we work, uh, there's a trans-NIH geroscience interest group involving 20 of the 27 institutes and centers. And what we do is we promote at each other's institutes research on aging. So you have diseases that are diseases of aging being studied in animals that are young. And we have asked the question, and institutes have participated in this, what happens if you study that disease of aging in an old laboratory animal? How does that affect your outcomes? It's still in the works, so we don't know the answer, but either answer is important. If you can study it profitably in the young, go ahead. If you can study it better in the old, we would like to help you do that. Good. So a kind of follow-up question to that, which I'm going to toss to all the panelists here, and some of you have already mentioned this, you know, the question is, are there any disparities in funding for different areas of basic aging research? And, and folks here have alluded that you've started in a field that's not quite aging, it's cancer research, but it's, of course, related to aging, and you have greater luck finding, finding uh, funding through that channel. Um, but it seems kind of what I'm hearing, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, that sometimes um, what I've heard with and Alzheimer's is, is a devastating illness, and we, we, are, we definitely need to see it um, reversed and, and, and slowed down, and it's a, it's a major problem that's happening. But do we also see the issue of a disease dragging the funding or the horse before the cart where there's a, you know, money's going after a disease, but, you know, we all, a lot of us here know that, you know, the, the major drivers of all of these diseases of aging are fundamental mechanisms of aging, right? And, and um, is it, do you, do you see that sort of the, where the, the funding is going is sort of, sort of the, I guess, the, the flavor of the month, and then it kind of shifts when, and, and the, the, fun, the, the funding agencies are losing track that we should be really kind of looking at the fundamental mechanisms that will actually help combat all of these issues. Um, do you see that as a problem, or do you, you know, or maybe not, I don't know. Uh, I do see this as a problem, uh, because, um, uh, people usually start thinking about aging um, in a very specific context. They want to live longer. Um, I'm not speaking about Vera, who is studying aging because she's interested in, in, in science, I think. Uh, among all of us, she's the, probably the most basic, in my opinion. But the um, majority of people start thinking about aging as about, about a disease. And uh, therefore, many of us and many of here people, they come into aging through certain disease. But as Vera mentioned a few minutes ago, that uh, why not to explain, uh, uh, you know, everybody that by treating aging, you treat all these diseases simultaneously or prevent fr them from happening. I think a lot here goes with the education. Uh, as long as FDA would recognize aging as a disease, which I think we are on the good track towards that direction, uh, probably uh, there will be, that will be reflected in bigger allocations to the National Institute of Aging uh, in terms of proportion of money which is given because I think aging would start finally competing with cancer because it's a cause of cancer and uh, it, it deserves to have more money. Uh, uh, as far as the uh, current situation is concerned, I think that the uh, biggest, the closest to basic science directions of aging research are those which are dealing with biomarkers of aging because they are going to most fundamental uh, you know, principles and they potentially may inf influence on all aspects of aging, regardless what is it, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer, or, c or cancer. Also, there is an interesting tradition. For example, cardiovascular, clearly age-related disease. But today, we didn't hear a single talk about cardiovascular. For some reason, it stays in its own niche. Cancer is easier to goes to aging than, than that one. So a lot of things are driven here by wrong traditions, and uh, I think uh, the uh, uh, meetings like this, their mission is not only to stimulate each other uh, to do better science, but also to do education of uh, uh, everybody, including decision makers uh, like uh, NIH or um, FDA, uh, to, uh, under, to recognize aging as a disease. and. They understand that the level of our understanding is so primitive right now that we have to start from basic mechanisms because we're not prepared to treat it yet. Yes, well, uh, I agree with everything that Andre said. Um, yeah, definitely there are disparities and uh, it's just easier for people to relate to specific diseases. So within aging uh, field, definitely 
a uh, huge amount of money now is going to Alzheimer's disease, which is understandable. It is a terrible disease, but it does happen with aging. So there is definitely underlying basic cause of Alzheimer's disease that's age-related, and uh, maybe not enough attention is being put there, because if we think about aging mechanism, and the several talks today uh, were you know, discussing accumulation of damage, uh, various types of molecular damage, uh, genetic damage, epigenetic damage, and, and this is the driver also including Alzheimer's disease because uh, you know I've been in discussions with several Alzheimer's disease experts and they're looking at you know the role of DNA damage in Alzheimer's disease too uh, but these are the types of grants that don't easily get funded and I think that is a big problem I, I hope it will be overcome somehow uh, again with education as Andre mentioned uh, when people understand that there are those underlying causes and that we can realistically, once we uh, understand those basic mechanisms, then we can realistically do something about it and then address all the diseases. Because so far what we are doing with those disease-focused studies, we treat the symptom, we don't treat the cause. Um, and I, I hope this you know, evolution in people's mind is happening, so it, it will take place. Uh, you know, in my case, for example, I was uh, doing studies of DNA repair was a young, when I, you know, like 15 years ago as a young assistant professor. That's what um, my first funding was for. But I wanted to pursue comparative biology, and then I would submit a grant to study naked mole rats. And, uh, you know, everyone was just laughing at it, and I couldn't get it funded for many, many years. But then everything just changed, you know, after we published papers where we showed we can get to molecular mechanisms. Uh, so the situation changed completely, so now we are well funded for those projects that 15 years ago seemed to be complete lunacy to you know, most people on the panel. So I think you know, there is hope, and uh, hopefully there will be more effort, uh, funding effort put into addressing the causes of aging. Yeah, I would um, advocate for, as I said actually in the previous commentary, um, that uh, the funding would be should be increased for basic research for fundamental biology of aging because uh, we still uh, don't understand what uh, aging is and as Aubrey mentioned there is uh, even a debate is uh, because the perspectives are completely different we have to realize I think that uh, aging comes from every biological process it's a consequence of uh, being alive an enzyme works produces damage a gene is expressed produces deleterious change. Those changes accumulate. And so if we uh, study a particular process, let's say telomeres or mitochondrial function, do we really study aging? Uh, I don't think so. So we can increase lifespan uh, slightly, but uh, fundamentally we don't understand aging. So I would, I would advocate really maybe issue an SRA or, or support some other uh, fundamental research because I think it's basically lacking. There are very few people actually who study, and I think it will be important to define. We currently disagree on the nature of aging, so everybody would define it differently. And if you think from this kind of deleterious changes perspective, then suddenly we could uh, design better approaches instead of targeting particular system, describe system as a whole, maybe through omics approaches or genomic approaches, and then monitor it. And then I think we, in, in the future we have a much greater chance to um, to achieve uh, what, both longevity and fight age-related diseases at the same time. That's my major concern, I would say. Basic fundamental biology of aging, which is lacking, more or less. So I guess I have a question for both you, Vadim um, and Andre, which is almost I'm hearing the two sides uh, to the same coin, which is, you know, is do you and everybody in between, do you think like maybe the biggest block to kind of unlocking um, massive funding you know, for for uh, longevity mechanism, basic aging research, is um, enough data sort of starts to accumulate where there is um, a widely accepted, I'm not going to say grand unified theory of aging, but let's say there is a massive consensus of the mechanisms of aging, and then that leads to the FDA redefining aging as a disease, and is that one of the major blocks? You know, I'm not part of the medical establishment, so I, I you know, the d a disease, I guess, by definition, technically only affects a subset of the population. But is, you know, is there, a, you know, is there some sort of, will there be some sort of um, breaking point reached where um, 
I guess, Ronald, you can chime in here that uh, where all of a sudden um, the funding floodgates open because there is some sort of consensus reached because of a, a certain level of basic research is convinced the medical establishment. And, and is that what it takes? I don't know. I have Are they just waiting for the basic research? No, 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 we're not, we're not waiting. We're, we're trying to move ahead um, in the midst of competing interests and, and regrettably you can't fund everything. Uh, you can't fund every good idea, and you can't fund every crazy idea that might work. Those are the more attractive to me anyway. Um, and you can't fund every new investigator, every established investigator. Um, and I'm not sure that a floodgate would work. The floodgates, when they open, tend to sweep away everything downstream, uh, f both physically and metaphorically. We increased our budget, as I mentioned, dramatically over the last five years. It is extremely difficult to deal with the flood of new money um, because there's a, an interaction between the availability of money and the availability of researchers to work in that area. So one of the things that NIA does is we distribute money to other institutes from this pool of Alzheimer's disease research uh, for any ideas that they might, people might have from their own fields of study where they think it might apply to this specific disease. Um, so we have those kinds of interactions. And we also have them at the level of the basic biology of a range of diseases. We have a program, actually the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute uh, set up, and we had some input on it, on aging and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, we fund some investigators in that, and they do as well. We have a program with the National Cancer Institute to have collaborations between extramural investigators and people who work at NIH laboratories to work on cancer and aging and the interactions between them. Uh, and we had an interaction going with uh, the now late R.T. Hurria at um, City of Hope on uh, all aspects of cancer and aging. Uh, and I should also point out that uh, in addition to the basic biology that we fund using um, animals as proxies for human aging, we also have large programs on human aging. So we are looking at uh, aging in humans. We're looking at all sorts of factors, sociological, economic, psychological. Uh, you just put biopsychosocial neuroengineering out there. There's actually departments with that conglomerate name. So uh, we fund all of this. They take samples. As ideas seem to mature in the laboratory animals and wild populations, those biological samples are available to see if you can translate what you've learned in the laboratory to humans under a range of conditions and a range of ethnicities as well. So um, we do these programs. As far as classifying aging as a disease, I can't wish you good luck with that. Um, I think it's the wrong approach fundamentally. Uh, and I think that uh, you, you pretty much nailed what it is. If everybody ages, it's not a disease. It's like everybody's been born. Birth is not a disease, although for humans at least, Birth is only a 30% outcome after uh, conception. So most conceptions don't result in a live birth, it turns out, uh, irrespective of how well developed the country is. There are other approaches um, to looking at aging and the FDA, to which you alluded to earlier in your talk, but you restricted it to you take a disease of aging and you work on that and then you move to another disease of aging. In the uh, now three meetings that I've attended with the uh, Food and Drug Administration, they will not classify aging as a disease. So save your breath, save your effort, don't try it. Don't try this at home and don't try this in the lab. It's not a disease, it's a condition. It's like saying uh, uh, sarcopenia is a disease, it's not a disease, it's a syndrome. So don't push a square peg into a round hole, but that doesn't mean that you can't uh, work on aging. As Bob Temple of the FDA said, if you get one drug that actually impacts aging per se and not a disease of aging, you change the entire game. You change a multi-trillion dollar industry affecting multi-billion people with that one outcome. So you want to treat aging as something that's malleable, where you can improve the health of people at any age, that will work. If you do it through um, looking at senolytics in osteoarthritis and you find that there's a secondary outcome that's also beneficial, that's also a condition or disease of aging, you have advanced the field. 
So there, again, that's not my area, that's a clinical study, um, but it all stems from doing the basic biology. As Vadim says, we need to understand it better. We can always hope to understand it better. Um, and at some point, when the uh, people doing the basic research start forming their own companies, that's when you know it's time to do the translational research and the translational work. Uh, I honestly, I'm, I'm a very sincere person, so please uh, forgive me for being uh, over sincere. I think it's a very bad sign when the official from National Institute of Aging refuses and actually not only refuses but gives me almost the um, uh, direction or advice not to look at aging as a disease. I think by itself, it's a, to me, it's a very worrying thing because if we would not do that, um, the uh, we would lose lots of inspiration. Uh, and I can tell you that, uh, I, can, uh, I can set an argument with you that in five, ten years from now, there will be indications such as uh, frailty, for example. And uh, uh, fr uh, the fact that something is happening with 100% penetrance does not mean it's not a disease. If you live long enough, you have 100% penetrance of cancer. It does not mean that cancer is not a disease. So uh, everything which is curable and allow you to be healthy and live longer can be, uh, can be defined as a disease. Because, and now I'm coming to your question. What will be the fundamental events which will turn situation into funding uh, of uh, aging into much more kind of uh, attractive things? Let's go to precedence. Um, well, uh, immunotherapy and oncology for many, you know, I'm in oncology for more than 40 years, is going up and down, but it never was the most funded area of, uh, of oncology. The moment we have success and we have cured patients, we have PD-1 uh, checkpoint, uh, you know, interrupting therapies, and we start seeing uh, stage four patients uh, who are recovering back to life, uh, there is a flood of funding. So the very first success of any kind, and the same thing we saw in aging. Remember, 2000, uh, what it was, 2011, uh, Baker et al., uh, Nature Paper, P16 Mice, you, you have a rejuvenation by killing, so I, I'm sure that there was a tremendous increase in the amount of funding, made not necessarily through an age, but through uh, foundations, through um, individuals uh, in, in institutions, so it was, it, it, it was really great hype. And I was told, I remember I had a conversation with some representatives of pharma and they said, if you demonstrate that the mouse can live 1.5 times longer uh, with, with your drug, it, for us it will be equivalent to the uh, successful end of phase two in humans uh, for, 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 for funding this. So every discovery which we make is the, uh, is the recipe to increase funding. So uh, any bright result will, will make it. And, uh, uh, I strongly disagree. Not uh, my advice to you. I, I know my voice versus an is nothing. Please don't follow this advice. Consider aging as a disease. <laughs> I love a good debate. <laughs> well, I, I think for basic researchers, yeah, whether it's defined as disease or not, it's probably not that cr crucial. But again, for uh, drug development, it probably is very important because um, I there is much bigger incentive to develop a drug that can be prescribed for an indication like aging or frailty, and if it cannot, uh, then it really slows uh, the progress. Uh, so I think it's really kind of a semantic question. I think we all understand that uh, all living things age, and um, you know, some people would for that reason refuse to call it a disease, but you know, if it helps, uh, get more funding for aging, you know, I could call it anything, it's just as long as we can get progress with it. <laughs> uh, so that's really the situation, but I, I think Andre really put it out very nicely that successes is what drives uh, things. You know, once we show that uh, there is a drug that maybe first was developed for a particular disease indication, but if now it addresses, um, for example, it, it slows, um, the rate of cancer, uh, it protects from cardiovascular disease, it maybe does something else. So then immediately there will be renewed interest and maybe those definition will not be that important anymore. So we really need more successes. Thank you for making me 
yeah, to make a piece, I would give a third perspective. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually wrote a, 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 per, a perspective uh, uh, two years ago on whether aging is, is a disease. And uh, we made the argument that it's, it's not a disease and it's not not a disease. So <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea there was <laughs> such a third perspective. Uh, uh, I, but but ultimately, ultimately, I think, um, yeah, it, it, it doesn't matter. I would agree with Vera here, so that um, we uh, need to find interventions that both slow down aging and at the same time um, uh, alleviate or, d or delay the onset of, of all of these diseases of aging at once. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank all of our uh, panelists here.